today, which households are hurting the most, according to the RBA? Hello again, this is Martin Earth from Digital Finance and the Lysis World Notice Post covering finance and property news. Well, the Reserve Bank Governor Michelle Bullock was back in front of the bright lights again on Friday, appearing at a House Economics Committee hearing. Now, at one level, she didn't have a lot more to add to what she had on Tuesday's press conference, but she emphasised two points which should give pause to those expecting multiple rate cuts this Canada year. And there were also a number of other very important pointers which I want to discuss today. And I'm going to incorporate some of her own words because I think it's quite interesting to hear from the horse's mouth, as it were. So quite a bit has changed at the RBA since we last appeared at the committee in August 23. Um, my seven-year term as governor started last September and a new deputy governor who's been appointed from outside the RBA, uh, he'll take up duties uh, next week. We've got a new statement on the conduct of monetary policy, which has been agreed by the Reserve, between the Reserve Bank Board and the Treasurer, and that makes explicit our mandate uh, for price stability and full employment, and it requires us to explain regularly how we're meeting these objectives. We would have the first of our board meetings under the new format, so that's eight meetings a year now, uh, each over an afternoon and a following morning. The media statement following the decision on Tuesday was issued by the board rather than the governor, and I held my first media conference. <laughs> um, and that's going to be a regular occurrence after each board meeting. The RBA also released its statement on monetary policy at the same time as the monetary policy decision rather than a few days later, which is how we would do it in the past. Um, the statement on monetary policy, that sets out our assessment of current economic conditions, our forecasts and risks around them and the key issues that are featured in the, in the bank's uh, board's monetary policy decision. On our previous timetable, the statement on monetary policy would have been released while this hearing was taking place. Um, so I hope this change has been valuable in enhancing the transparency of our decision on Tuesday and also some benefit for all of you uh, ahead of the hearing. So one thing that has not changed since our previous hearing in 2023 is the challenge presented by high inflation. We all remain acutely aware that the cost of living is rising much faster than it has over recent decades. It's been evident over the past couple of years in many of the essential goods and services we all buy, but also in a myriad of other goods and services that we might regard as a bit more discretionary. At its peak, almost 80 per cent of the items in the Consumer Price Index were recording price rises of more than 3 per cent per annum. So the problem has been a very broad-based one. Now, this is why the board is focused on bringing inflation down. The board understands that interest rates has put, um, the rise in interest rates has put additional pressure on households that have mortgages, but the alternative of lower interest rates and high inflation for a prolonged period would be even worse for these households, as well as all the households without mortgages. It would also make it more likely that inflation expectations would adjust upwards, and if this were to happen, it would be much more costly to address. It would involve high inflation for longer and even higher interest rates and a larger rise in unemployment to bring it down. Now, recent developments in inflation are encouraging. Since peaking at 7.8 per cent in the December quarter of 2022, inflation declined to 4.1 per cent at the end of 2023. Nevertheless, inflation is still high. As you know, since the early 1990s, the board has had a target for annual consumer price inflation of between 2 and 3 per cent on average over time. The new statement on the conduct of monetary policy endorses this, but it makes it more explicit that we should be aiming for the middle of the range, which is 2.5 per cent. So we still have some way to go before we meet our target. I should add here that we're not unique in experiencing a period of above target inflation. Inflation has been a challenge in most economies around the world, particularly those with which we commonly uh, typically compare ourselves. At least initially, this was the result of global supply chain issues, coupled with strong demand for goods and services and rising energy prices. This saw inflation around the world ri uh, rise to rates not experienced for many years, if not decades. As these influences have subsided, global inflation has eased, and there has been some encouraging progress towards central bank targets, 
But the services sector inflation remains high in many countries, partly reflecting demand remaining above supply and the associated tightness in labour markets. On Tuesday, we released our updated forecasts for the economy and inflation. These forecasts have inflation returning to the top of the target range, 3%, in 2025, and to reach the midpoint of the target range by 2026. Importantly, these forecasts are conditioned on the assumption that inflation expectations remain anchored at the midpoint of our target range. Furthermore, these are our central forecasts, and there's a great deal of uncertainty around inflation outcomes that far out. Even if the economy evolves around this central path, inflation will still have been outside the target range for four years. The longer inflation remains high and outside the target range, the greater is the risk that inflation expectations of households and businesses will adjust higher. And if that happens, then the risks of inflation becoming entrenched at a higher level will rise. This is the balancing act that the Board is focusing on. We're trying to bring inflation back to target without slowing the economy more than necessary on the one hand or risking high inflation for longer on the other. So this leads me now to the Board's recent um, thinking, its thinking and its recent decisions. So at the time we last met in August, <clears throat> the cash rate was at 4.1 per cent. The Board had left the cash rate at that level since June and indeed it continued to hold until November when it increased the cash rate by a further 25 basis points to 4.35 per cent. The decision to raise the cash rate at that time was based on information that had been coming through on inflation, the labour market and economic activity. The weight of that information, plus the, the RBA's updated forecasts, suggested um, that the risk of inflation remaining higher for longer had increased. The Board noted that while the economy was experiencing a, below, a period of below-trend growth, it had been stronger than expected over the first half of 2023. Underlying inflation was higher than expected at the time of the August forecast, particularly in services, and conditions in the labour market had eased but remained tight. In addition, at the time, housing prices were continuing to rise across the country. So all these factors, plus the fact that inflation was projected to remain above 3 per cent for another two years, led the Board to increase interest rates to be more assured that inflation would return to target in a reasonable time frame. Now, since then, we've received more information on the economy and inflation. So first to the economy. Tighter monetary policy has contributed to a further slowing in demand. Weak household spending growth, particularly in per capita terms, has been only partly offset by strong growth in business investment and public demand. That said, labour market conditions remain tight, but they have continued to ease over recent months in response to slower economic growth. The unemployment rate and the underemployment rate have both increased by around half a percentage point since mid-23. Uh, that's from low levels, though. Wages growth remains strong by the standards of the past few years, although there are signs that it's slowing um, in some segments of the labour market. Firms now expect wages growth to ease over the year ahead. However, some very, uh, very weak productivity outcomes have contributed to sharp increase in uh, labour costs per unit of output. So we put all this together. Our overall assessment is that the aggregate level of demand has remained above the economy's supply capacity and conditions in the labour market are still tight relative to what would be consistent with sustained full employment and inflation at target. This means that the slowing in aggregate demand that we're observing is helping to ease inflationary pressures, but we're not yet where we need to be. Consistent with this, inflation has moderated. Headline and underlying inflation were both lower in the December quarter than had been expected at the time of our November Statement on Monetary Policy. Goods price inflation was softer than expected, and that's a pattern that's also been seen overseas. Services price inflation remained high. Indeed, while inflation was lower than we were expecting in November, this is largely attributable to softer than expected goods inflation. Services inflation was pretty much where we forecast it to be. High services inflation is reflecting strong growth in both labour and non-labour input costs. Historically, um, services inflation typically runs above goods price inflation, 
So in the couple of decades prior to the pandemic, inflation averaged about 2.5%, but within that, goods price inflation averaged around 2%, while services inflation averaged around 3%. So while we don't necessarily need services inflation to be at the midpoint of the 2 to 3 per cent range to meet our target, we do need it to be a little bit lower than it currently is. Now, one issue I, I haven't met, uh, mentioned yet is the other part of our mandate, which is full employment. While full employment, I, I should emphasise, has always been part of the RBA's mandate, the new statement on the conduct of monetary policy and indeed the Reserve Bank Bill makes it much more explicit. It says the RBA will conduct monetary policy in a way that will best contribute to both price stability and full employment. Full employment for these purposes is the current maximum level of employment that is consistent with low and stable inflation. I've spoken about this in the past, emphasising that our two objectives are mostly complementary. So over the longer term, low and stable inflation is necessary to achieve full employment. This is also front of mind for the board members as we battle inflation. The board is attempting to bring inflation down while preserving as many of the gains in the labour market as possible, what my pre predecessor Phil called the narrow path. So far, we're observing that the labour market conditions are easing, although they remain tighter than we think is consistent with low and stable inflation. Our forecasts are for employment to continue to grow, but more slowly than over the past few years, but these outcomes are dependent upon inflation returning to target in a reasonable time frame and inflation expectations not drifting up. If that would occur, inflation expectations drifting up, it will be much more costly in terms of employment to get inflation down. So, in summary, while there's some encouraging signs, Australia's inflation challenge isn't over. An inflation rate with a four in front of it isn't good enough and it's still some way from our, the midpoint of our target so given this, the board held the cash rate target at 4.35 per cent at its meeting earlier this week. It noted that the path of interest rates that will best ensure that inflation returns to target in a reasonable time frame will depend upon the data and the evolving assessment of risks. At this stage, the board hasn't ruled out a further increase in interest rates, but neither has it ruled it in. However, the substantial costs to the economy and the Australian people of continued high inflation, the board is committed to bringing inflation back to target in a reasonable time frame. Now, in terms of those critical points, the first was in response to a question on inflation expectations. But the time inflation gets back to the midpoint of the target band of 2 to 3%, as required by the RBA's new mandate, which occurs sometime beyond the middle of 2026 on the RBA's latest forecast, inflation will have been outside the target range for four years, which is right at the edge of what the LBA will tolerate. A year ago, um, not only us, but many others were expecting um, much more slowing in the, in the world economy than has actually occurred. The US in particular has turned out to be much more resilient than I think many people were expecting. Um, I think at one point there was discussion of um, hard landing, then it moved to soft landing, and then no landing at all. Um, and it's continuing to uh, demonstrate great resilience. Um, it's fair to say, though, that um, we are observing, in response to higher interest rates, we are observing global growth slowing. Um, one important uh, part for us, of course, is that China is our major trading partner, and China, um, growth in China has been quite sluggish. It's, it's by Chinese terms. Um, so that's something for us to watch. The main way through which that impacts Australia is through commodity prices and our exports to China. So far, the iron ore price in particular and coke and coal prices have tended to hold up um, because even though the real estate industry in China is, is not doing so well, uh, the manufacturing industry and public infrastructure is doing quite well. So those sort of things are holding it up. But that's something that we need to watch closely. Um, so I think the way I would, I would describe it is that um, we are watching what's going on overseas closely because it, it does impact us. That is something that if, it's, if the conditions slow more, more quickly than we're expecting overseas, then that might well have implications for us as well. But if I look back a year ago, I think things have generally held up better than many people thought, many people thought they would. And as I've said, part of the evidence of that is the difficulty in getting services inflation down in many countries. <laughs> 
as we, as we go further out, we get more, we get more and more uncertainty. Um, I would say that very recent developments in the Chinese property market haven't changed what we've got in built into our forecast. We've, mm -hmm. we've got that already built in. I don't think that necessarily... Uh, the recent um, news, for example, about Evergrande, I don't think that changes anything. We already had uh, a lot of that built in. Um, so, but I think people forget that um, sometimes that um, we are setting monetary policy in an uncertain environment, and that's why we, not just we, but other central banks around the world, we do look to the data to confirm that we're on the path we think we're on. And if the data tell us something different, then we have to be prepared to, um, to think about where we might need to tweak our forecasts or our thinking. Um, it's fair to say at the moment that um, our forecasts, we feel we've balanced the risks on either side, um, but that can change depending on the way the data comes out. So uh, at the moment I'd say, yes, we've got it balanced, but we, we're going to have to watch the data and see if our thinking is confirmed in that respect. We feel that aggregate demand is still a bit above aggregate supply, and that's why we're observing inflation. Um, the aim is to bring, bring it to slow growth, that is part of the aim, um, and to bring it back more towards supply. And if we can achieve that um, in our current central forecasts, we can achieve that without um, slowing, slowing the growth in the labour market but, but um, not too much, then I think we've got on the narrow path. So I, don't, I think, you know, at the moment we're reasonably comfortable, um, but we need to be very alert. Um, we are seeing, um, as I said, we are seeing um, goods price inflation moderate, and that's partly coming, and that's partly offshore. We've seen the supply chains um, uh, correct themselves. So we're expecting that. It has slowed a little bit more quickly than we thought, and I think the same has been observed overseas. Um, the, the services inflation, which is being driven by both labour and non-labour input costs, that's remaining a little bit elevated at the moment. And we're forecasting that that's going to come down, but it's going to come down more slowly than goods price inflation. And uh, that is also the expectation of central banks overseas. They're observing the mm -hmm. same thing. So it's indicative that demand is still a bit above supply, notwithstanding that demand, demand is slowing. Um, so in our central forecast, we do have it coming back to target, but it's coming back more slowly than goods price inflation. Um, having said that, there are some things out on the horizon that, you know, are worrying. Um, on the upside, there's lots of conflicts that could result in supply chain issues arising again. Um, there's also, as we discussed, China um, and it's slowing, so that might be on the downside, um, and it might be that consumption here slows more quickly than we're expecting, um, and that would be a downside risk to the forecast. The longer inflation remains high and outside the target range, the greater is the risk that inflation expectations of households and businesses will adjust higher. Bullock said. And if that happens, then the risks of inflation becoming entrenched at a high level will rise. This is a balancing act that the board is focusing on. Now, Bullock also fielded several questions on productivity, and along with Marion Kohler, the RBA's head of economic analysis, they outlined a case for productivity growth to improve from very low levels back to pre-pandemic levels of 1%. I said at the press conference, and um, so I'd just reiterate it here, um, there's been a lot of focus on productivity and the lack of growth in productivity over the past five, six years or so. Uh, but if you look at actually measured productivity um, levels, it, it's been all over the place. It's been up, it's been down. The pandemic really threw productivity measures into quite a lot of spin. It was, it's been difficult. And people have got quite focused on looking at little quarterly movements in productivity. Is it up, is it down, and so on. Um, I think what we would prefer to do is take a step back and think about it more in a long run or longer run perspective, because um, it is a long run concept. It's, it's, so um, in our forecasts, we do have positive productivity returning, and we have it returning to somewhat of its, its uh, trend prior to the last few years when it's been all over the place. Um, 
it is important that um, productivity returns, and, and I guess I'd call myself a bit of a productivity optimist. I think there are good reasons to think that it will return. Um, and it doesn't just mean uh, laying people off. Um, it means investment in technology. It means investment in more efficient ways of doing things. We are seeing businesses invest. We are seeing technology improvements, which will take some time to become evident. Um, so, you know, we've, we've got some of that built into our forecasts, which is one of the things that will help to bring um, unit labour costs back to more normal growth rates. Pandemic supply chain disruptions ease. Workers that firms have hired in the tight labour market get trained up and produce more, and businesses lift investment. Now, clearly, Bullock has no wish to lash governments for a lack of policy responses to the dire productivity growth, but her answer left the impression the RBA's forecasts in this area are more, well, hope than anticipation. HSBC's chief economist Paul Bloxham actually argues a focus on productivity enhancing reform that boosts the supply side of the economy would be the best way to help to disinflate the economy, but the chances of this are frankly slim to none. Which leaves Bullock in a bind. If the supply side productivity doesn't improve, then she will have to rely on weaker demand to push inflation down to the 2.5% target, but the RBA's own forecasts show that this is going to take at least another 30 months, given full employment and the resident consumer. And on Friday, Bullock emphatically corrected the notion that households had spent down their COVID savings. Australia, in fact, most of the savings that people built up during the pandemic are still there. And the savings rate is still positive. It's lower than it typically is, but it is still positive. So there's two parts to this. The first is that um, consumption might be affected because households lower their, they can lower their saving rate. So they can say, well, I used to save X percent, now I'm going to save a little bit less and support my consumption. The block of savings that people saved during the pandemic might be an option to say, well, I'm going to run some of that down. Um, the point I think is important to remember here is that um, the block of savings that is sitting there, a lot of it is sitting in mortgage offset and redraw mm -hmm. accounts. And as interest rates rise, there's much more incentive for people to offset. So, so the question of whether they run it down is going to come down to, well, do I run this down to support my savings or do I keep it there because it's, it's offsetting my much higher interest rates on my mortgage now? Okay. So the incentives are, are different. But um, yes. I guess what I'm saying is the premise of your idea that somehow we've run down our savings, um, we haven't. But well, if, we, if we take, sorry, I'm happy yeah. to, to yeah. correct. The, the savings that were accrued during that period have, mm. have largely been exhausted. Uh, no. Yeah, so that's what I, I don't think is correct. Mm. I, I think depending exactly how you measure it, but I think reasonable assumptions would suggest that the, the stock was so large that it's only been more recently that the saving rate has fallen below sort of pre-pandemic norms, but that large pile of savings is still sitting still there, there, including in mortgage and offset accounts. Okay. And indeed, um, somewhat surprisingly, we've seen the extra payments into these accounts, the offset and redraw accounts, go up a little bit as a share of income in the last few quarters, and I think some of that is what the Governor was talking about. Higher interest rates are providing incentive to pay down mortgages as fast as they can, um, and that's what's happening, even though consumption is very weak. So I think it's just a sign that monetary policy is working. It's constraining the growth of demand, including consumption, and encouraging savings, and that's a way that monetary policy works. So that the, we, the, I'm assuming then from that the forecasting assumes that the smoothing or restriction constriction has taken place and will largely hold across that period? Yeah, we're, the, we're, we're forecasting yeah. basically that the slowing in consumption that we're seeing is yeah. going, to, going to be continuing into the forecast period and, um, and that, um, I'm going back to the international comparison again, um, my memory of the United States is that it's happened differently over there. They have run down their savings. Mm. They have basically supported consumption by running down all the savings that they had accumulated during the pandemic. That hasn't happened here. The savings are still pretty much there. People are adjusting their consumption to their current income rather than relying on their savings accumulated to fund their consumption.
Indeed, UBS economist George Thaliou said extra mortgage payments actually rebounded in the December quarter to $8.9 billion. That's the highest since the June quarter of 2022, despite the combination of 13 rate rises driving total shares of repayments to a record $40.4 billion, or a 9.8% share of income. The stage three tax cuts will put more money into the economy in July, although Bullock again emphasised that this is built into the central bank's forecasts. And with the US Federal Reserve likely to cut in the middle of the year, thanks ironically to surging productivity that is bringing inflation down faster than expected, the RBA is unlikely to lift interest rates, although Bullock again emphasised on Friday this does remain a possibility. But the case for rate cuts this year is also getting harder to make. Does the economy slow faster than expected, despite the strong labour market data and household savings? And is there some external shock from geopolitical, perhaps? So Bullock has actually got progressively more hawkish as a long week in the spotlight has worn on. And Fanino now has the RBA cutting rates in November, but Bloxham doesn't expect cuts until 2025. And... Probably it's true to say, in my view, that investors should probably consider actively the latter case. Rates won't come down very soon. Now, in terms of specific discussion points, there was an interesting discussion around the bank of mum and dad. The RBA doesn't track the impact of the bank of mum and dad, which I think they probably should, because to my mind, it's a very important factor, which is driving a lot of weird behaviour across the economy. I have two topics I'd like to cover with you, one on housing and then the other on stage three. To housing, I'd like to specifically focus on the bank of mum and dad. Uh, in my home city of Melbourne, there's about 972 suburbs. If we take the average income of about 93,000 and we take the median house, which is a modest house, uh, we would see, assuming a deposit of 20% is saved, it's a big assumption, um, that person on an average income could only afford three out of 972 houses and only rises to 52 for units. So we're now seeing the bank of mum and dad become about the ninth largest lender, an option not open to everyone. So my question to you is, how do you measure the scale of the loans through the bank of mum and dad? And do you account for gifts and undocumented loans in that? Um, I think the answer to that is we don't actually know um, what's going on there. Um, we get very good data on lending from financial institutions um, and we get some, uh, even get very specific individual data um, anonymised in, in um, a thing called our securitisation database which gives us information on individual loans, incomes, those sorts of things. But we don't have any information on bequests, bank of mum and dad, anything like that. Thank you. Uh, is that something you think would be useful for the bank uh, to have data on? And is it something you would consider looking at? Um, I don't think it really plays into our thinking about financial conditions. Um, um, we, we obviously monitor uh, growth, of, growth of credit. Um, as I said, we've got a lot of information on, on that sort of thing. Um, we can uh, determine uh, we've got a lot of information on interest rates, real-time information on interest rates. Um, but I'm not sure that sort of information on sort of a question bank of mum and dad is additional information which would help us f um, define financial conditions more, more um, appropriately. I think um, where you see that turn up is you see it turn up in things like housing prices, which we can't do anything about. Um, it's housing prices. Again, we talk about supply and demand. That's really what is determining housing prices and rents as well. But mm. I'm not sure that um, uh, information on the bank of mum and dad is going to help us um, really define um, financial conditions more appropriately than we currently do. Do you think generally, without having access to the data, that it would have an impact on housing demand and therefore inflation? Well, it's to the extent that the bank of mum and dad is bringing forward wealth and providing it to another generation and helping them to purchase houses, um, yes, it is adding to demand. But um, um, I, don't, I don't think that um, the 
first order effect here is bank of mum and dad. I think the first sure. order effect here is about supply of well-located land and housing um, versus demand. Thank you. And of course, house pricing is being driven partly by it. And there was also a discussion about the distributional impact of the inflation pressures and who's hurting. The thing about the Australian inflation numbers quarterly is that it, we only get a read on momentum quarterly. We've got the CPI monthly indicator now, which helps a bit, but it, it's still quite volatile and it, it moves up and down quite a lot. Um, other countries have monthly CPIs and it's actually easier to get a read in a monthly sense about where, where momentum's going. So, you know, it's back to this point again that you get one quarterly number and then we'll get some CPI indicators which are volatile and still a bit difficult to interpret. So we still, you know, placing your faith on one quarterly number, you know, if we got another couple of quarters, that would be great and that would be mu give us much more confidence that we're heading where we need to go. But just one quarterly number and annualising it, I think, is... Um, but because, of course, if you'd um, done that for the previous quarter, you would have said, you know, 1.2, 1, 1. I think it was, something like that. Mm -hmm. If you'd annualised that for the previous quarter, you would have said, wow, we're way behind the eight ball. So there's danger in just taking one number and, um, and annualising it and basing it on that. Thank you. Um, is there any research occurring in the bank at the moment about the distributional impacts of the current bout of accelerated inflation and interest rates? Um, you mean on um, different income cohorts on their, how inflation affects them differently? Inflation and interest rates, yep. Yep, okay. Yeah. Do you want to take that? Yep. Or, or Brad? Yeah, Brad. Brad can start. Yeah, thanks. Um, we certainly uh, uh, are spending a lot of time trying to unpack that. What, uh, let me give you uh, I guess a tangible expression of some of that research. Uh, what we've found is that uh, prior to the um, outbreak of, of higher inflation and, and higher rates in response to that, there are only about 3 per cent of borrowers, of variable rate owner-occupied borrowers, who are experiencing negative cash flow each month. Our sense is that for the, for the lowest income uh, borrowers, that that number's gone from 3 to 12 per cent over the last sort of 18 months or so. So, uh, yeah, it's, a, it, it's, a, uh, it's an active area uh, of our research. Obviously, policy is going to be set primarily based on the aggregates, but uh, we are investing very heavily in our systems to better pull apart that dis disaggregated data to get a better, ha better handle on, you know, how um, all types of borrowers uh, in the Australian community are faring. Thank you. That's, that's very interesting information about the absolute level of the distributional impacts. Could you give me some colour on your sense of the relative level of the distributional impacts? And I guess what I'm really asking is the impact of this period of higher inflation and interest rates on equality. Well, um, higher inflation typically hits the lower income people um, harder because they're spending more of their income on essentials, which is what you were talking about earlier. So that's certainly, that's certainly the case. Um, there's other uh, organisations that have done some work on this. There was some work done by um, uh, the Grattan Institute, um, which was presented at a conference we ran last year, which looked at the impact of inflation on different cohorts. Um, it impacts everyone. It impacts obviously the lower income people more. Um, and, um, but at the same time, um, during the pandemic and the growth in the labour force and, and so on, it's actually the lower income uh, end of the spectrum that actually did slightly better out of that process. They, they earned more income, um, they got more jobs. Um, so there's a few things going on here that, um, you know, inflation is, is the um, obviously impacting everyone, but it does have impact the, the, um, the lower incomes more. Thank you. Um, relative to previous periods of elevated in inflation in decades past, um, it's, it's probably fair to say that there are more older Australians relative to younger Australians as the demographic profile has changed. 
And as a consequence, it would be fair to say there are more Australians today on fixed incomes and a smaller proportion of the total population of Australians today with mortgages. Um, probably true. I haven't... The share of people with mortgages hasn't changed. No. Not that much, but they're not fixed. Yeah, yeah. That's the... Um, I mean, so... The, the general number we think of is that around about 30% of owner-occupiers have... Uh, people who own the home have a mortgage, 30% rent. And in terms of a homeowner, home ownership, 30%, about a third own their own home outright, about a third rent, and about a third have a mortgage. The number of people with a mortgage actually is much is higher than that because um, people with investment properties have mortgages as well, so I think it's probably more like 45 to 50% actually have a mortgage. Um, whether or not that's very different from the past, I, I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, but um, I would have thought that generally those third, a third, a third in terms of home tenure, I think has been reasonably stable over a reasonable, reasonable period of time, I think. And um, if, if there are more older Australians than, than in previous decades of, of inflation and more people who are on fixed incomes and we have a, a higher number of people who might be therefore benefiting from higher interest rates. Um, could you talk a little bit about how that impacts the operation of monetary policy to have that larger cohort of Australians who are benefiting from higher in interest rates because they're on fixed incomes? So if you look at um, the breakdown of household disposable income, um, the, um, the impact on, on aggregate household disposable income of um, higher interest rates um, is there's two components to it. There's those that gain and there's those that, that um, pay out. And my memory is that the people who pay out are still outweighing... The amount that's paid out is still outweighing the amount of extra income that people are getting from. So notwithstanding that, that's, it's still the case that the net effect is that it lowers in aggregate household disposable income by raising interest rates. Yeah, I would hope so. I thought raising interest rates would have the opposite effect of what you, uh, of what you intend. But, but my question is really about the relative size of those two groups. And if we have a larger group over time who are benefiting from higher interest rates because we have a larger group uh, from, uh, uh, of older Australians and therefore that balance of people who benefit from higher interest rates is changing, surely that has quite a big impact on the way that um, you think about Well, you're here. talking about a very, very long run um, process here. And I think in terms of setting interest rates now, that, that sort of shift isn't, isn't something that's playing into, into thinking at the moment. What you're talking about is very long run demographic changes. So does it potentially impact um, how monetary policy flows through? Possibly. Um, but um, recall that, um, and we've made this point a number of times, that um, people focus very much on the cash flow channel here, which is what you're focusing on, that the impact of mortgage holder, on mortgage holders of an increase in interest rates. But the other factor, two other factors, one is um, the fact that as interest rates rise, it encourages people to save more, and that applies to people who are earning more income as well from higher interest rates. Higher interest rates encourage them to save more because they'll earn more. So it's not straightforward, to, I don't think, just to say that higher interest rates mean that um, people who have savings are going to be out sort of um, uh, spending all their higher savings because they're actually incentivised to save more because interest rates are higher. And then there's the exchange rates, the other, the other um, thing, which isn't relevant to this conversation, but it, it's, not, it's not, I don't think, straightforward to say that as the older cohort um, increases in size, to the extent it does, they have more savings, therefore um, monetary policy has less impact. It's not, not quite straightforward to say that, in my view. But, Governor, don't we have information from the commercial banks suggesting that that is absolutely what's happening, that the consumption of older Australians uh, has been much stronger than the consumption of younger Australians? Uh, uh, through this period? Yeah, I'll get Marion yeah. to speak so, directly to so, that. So going back from the long run to the shorter run, I just want to say I'm not sure whether that's true over 
you know, a few decades. We don't have the data, but we, so we get that data, transaction data, some of that is public, some of it not, that is split up. Um, I think the broad trend is actually there's not that many different, there's not that much difference between the different groups. But when you look, yes, the, um, it's actually come down, but the, the older households, ha consumption has held up a little bit better. But it actually also didn't bounce back as much after the opening, so the older people have actually stayed a little bit longer at home. And so it's really hard to say whether within those wiggles there is meaning in there where people just have had a different response to um, how willing they were to go out and, say, to cafes, restaurants, those things um, uh, after the opening and the pandemic. So we're still seeing those effects flow through. Yeah. The data shows that it's actually everyone has slowed their consumption. Mortgage holders, non-mortgage holders, young, old, retirees, um, everyone has slowed. There are some small differences, but actually not as, not, as, not as big as all that, I don't think. If we could um, make this the final question, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, I, I guess um, certainly the, the perception from some people in my community is that, and this was perception that seems obvious, that the people who have been hit hardest by rising interest rates are those people mm. with mortgages and are therefore impacted. Mm. And many of the older cohorts who have uh, been beneficiaries of higher interest rates, their consumption has been more resilient. I think we've seen some evidence of that, as I said, from the commercial banks. It does change the way we think about both the distributional aspects of monetary policy and also uh, the, the effectiveness of monetary policy. And these are quite these are quite long-run phenomena, but the last time we had uh, elevated levels of uh, inflation and interest rates is, you know, a decade ago, and then a couple of decades before that. So this, this does matter to the way that we think about monetary policy and its effectiveness on the macro economy and its distributional consequences, doesn't it? We fully accept that interest rates affect different parts of the uh, community differently, um, and. In a period when we had really low interest rates, there was a lot of people who were pretty upset with that as well. So, as you rightly point out, different parts, different people, different households, depending on the circumstances, are going to be impacted different by, differently by monetary policy. We know that. But we can't do anything about that. We have, we have one instrument. We need to focus on aggregate demand and aggregate supply, and governments have other ways of dealing with the sort of circumstances that you're talking about. So, and in fact, you know, they have um, done some things in terms of electricity and um, childcare and things like that, where they they have been using their own levers to try and address some of these pinch points for people. Um, but we fully accept that yes, there are and, and understand that there are distributional implications of interest rates moving up and down. They affect different people in different ways. And once again, they did share some information, but I'm not sure that they went into sufficient detail to be able to actually identify what I think is important. Not everybody is equally impacted by what's going on. And of course, savings is not held equally across all households, nor indeed on mortgage repayments. So I think this distributional conversation needs to be developed further. Anyway, the bottom line is this. If you have the expectation that rates are going to be cut very soon, I think you need to change your strategy. It's probably going to be next year. And the global uncertainties, as well as local uncertainties, make the future very uncertain at this stage. At least we got a very straightforward set of answers from Bullock, which I think is a good thing. But I do believe the RBA has more to do to be able to build confidence that they really know what's going on. So watch this space. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching. And I'll see you again next time.